1 Corinthians chapter 13, that's our text. Navigate on your device, open your Bible so you can follow along. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version, if that is meaningful to you. The topic, Paul tells the believers in Corinth that they have not love in their exercise of the Holy Spirit's gifts. The title of our message, Gifts Without Heart and You're to Blame. You give love a bad name. <laughs> Thank you. Let's be serious. <laughs> Father, thank you for our morning thus far. We're anxious to get into your word and have it get into us. I know that's an odd expression, Lord, but it, it, it does express our desire to draw closer to you because of what you can do deep in our hearts. This text is so familiar. Uh, it, all of us have read it multiple times. So we've seen it printed on cards, on walls, everywhere. I pray that that would not hinder us from receiving new blessing from it. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. And those who agreed said, amen. You probably heard a Bible teacher say that the Greek language has these four different words for love. <clears throat> Eros is a word for love that describes, as you might guess, uh, sexual love. Storge is a second word for love. It refers to a family love, the kind of love there is between a parent and a child or between family members in general. Philia, that's a third word for love. Sometimes people say it's phileo. Uh, it, it speaks of a brotherly friendship and affection. It's the love of deep friendship and partnership. It might be described as the highest love of which man without God's enabling is capable of. Agape is a fourth word for love. It is a self-giving, self-sacrificing, selfless love that gives without demanding or expecting anything in return. Although the Apostle John does use agape to describe a love humans have for sin in the world, we most associate it with the supernatural love of God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to be our savior. I found that there are two additional loves in the Greek language that you rarely hear about. Pragma, a long-standing love, is a mature, realistic love that is commonly found amongst long-established couples, and philousia, or self-love. There may be some others as well. But I'd like to suggest this morning a seventh love, not in a scholarly sense. I know next to nothing about the Greek language of the New Testament. And I've told you before not to, you know, uh, burn anybody. But a lot of times when pastors say in the Greek, it says this. All we've really done is gone to Strong's Concordance. Uh, we, we don't have anything, you know, and especially if they tell you the verb tense. It's in the intransitive second person plural period. Uh, no one knows what that means except Greek scholars. But a lot of times they'll say, it's in this tense, so it cannot mean anything else but what I want to tell you it means. And so I, I, I fess up, I don't know anything about Greek. I know very little about English, uh, except I'm thankful that my parents spoke it and I learned it. But anyway, so think of this as a devotional thought. It is suggested in our text as agape we do not want to characterize our lives. You see it in each of the opening three verses. If you are reading from the New King James Version, see the word love in verses 1, 2, and 3. It is in each occurrence preceded by what two words? The additional love I'm suggesting is have not love. We'll see that it's a state that the believer can be in even though he or she is exercising gifts of the Holy Spirit or doing powerful works for God. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, if you have not love, you're going to injure other members of Jesus' body. And number two, if you have love, you will encourage other members of Jesus' body. Let's take a look at having not love in the first three verses. Have not love can be seen in at least one other place in the New Testament. It isn't called by that name, but the condition being described is similar. It's the description Jesus gives in his letter to the church in Ephesus. He praises them for their various works, but then he says rather dramatically, nevertheless, I have this against you, you have left your first love. So the church in Ephesus lacked love. The church in Corinth lacked love. We must conclude that any church can lack love and that any of us individually may have not love. 
What's more, like the believers in those two first century churches, we may not even recognize that we have not love. Now, we're in the middle of the Apostle Paul issuing correction to the Corinthians for their misuse of the gifts they have been given by God, the Holy Spirit. The correction began in chapter 12, and it's going to go all the way through chapter 14. That's one block of thought. The crux of it was that the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues. That's from chapter 14. So they were uh, certainly abusing the gift of tongues, elevating it <clears throat> over all the other gifts. And uh, everybody right now, instead of teaching the word, everybody would be standing up or sitting down or falling down, speaking in tongues. And so that was the church at Corinth. The real problem, though, was that by doing that, they were calling attention to themselves and away from Jesus. Their gifts were not benefiting others in the body, only themselves. They were chasing visitors away, visitors who needed to hear the gospel. That's not agape. It is have not agape. And so let's take a look at the verses themselves. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. First thing to note is that each of the opening three verses indicate the person with have not love can nevertheless perform mighty deeds. Thus, it can be initially hard to recognize. The believers who were speaking in tongues seem to have concluded that they were on a par with the angels. Since they were speaking in tongues all at once, they thought it a beautiful chorus of worship. But instead of sounding like a choir of angels, they were each one more like a clanging cymbal played out of order, amplified by a device called a sounding brass. Have you ever come out of Save Mart and heard the garage band that plays across the street? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on, you have. Uh, every now and then, and, and they're just terrible. They're awful. It's next door to the mortgage company there. And it's just, you know, I, I want to drive over there because I can hear it from Save Mart's parking lot. And I think, well, who are you guys? You know, and it, it's just awful. But uh, this is more like everybody in the church with a, with a different gong or cymbal. And it's like, go for it. And everybody's just at their own pace and their own tempo. And you ever have your kids do something that's just super annoying? They just keep doing it over and over and over again. Have I ever told you my jack-in-the-box story? Have I, have, raise your hand if I've told the jack-in-the-box story. This is my only memory from my childhood. We lived in Connecticut. This is going to take time, but it's worth it. We lived in Connecticut, and we drove across country in a 57 Plymouth station wagon. By we, I mean my mom and my dad and my two older brothers. And so I sat in the back like a real American. <laughs> No seat belts, no safety laws, no speed limit. I mean, anyway, so we were there, and I had a jack in the box. <laughs> and my dad, I, I will say this, he gave me warning, and I just ignored it until he violently pulled the car over, told my brother Tony to get that thing and throw it out into the field which he did, and then we took off for California. <laughs> All right. I just, I don't know if I can go on. But anyway, we might consider the exercise of spiritual gifts in public like the playing of a symphony orchestra being conducted by a great master conductor. We each have our necessary and proper place in the symphony, but we can exercise our gift or our gifts in such a way as to call attention to ourselves and away from the conductor. We can be like a gong or a cymbal being played loudly out of place. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Spectacular displays of supernatural power. But as one commentator mused, you can lift the mountain, but you then drop it on others. And so the, the miracle itself is not what you're going for. Verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Paul said of such displays, I am nothing and it profits me nothing. It doesn't help others and it's not good for you. How does this have not love happen? After all, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit who is God and therefore is love. He works to produce the fruit of the Spirit in and through our lives. 
and the fruit of the Spirit is love. I know in Galatians there it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, and then it describes some other things, but many people think that those are just secondary descriptions of love. That love, is, because we see here in a minute that love is not on a par with kindness and gentleness and patience. Love is its own thing. And so uh, the, the Spirit is love, and He produces the, spirit of love, or the fruit of love. At least one way we have not love is revealed when Paul said to the believers in Galatia, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? In context, Paul was warning them to not return to Judaism with its rites and rituals. But it applies more broadly to the fact that believers have a tendency to yield themselves to the flesh. In some cases, that can mean a return to rules and rites and rituals as a means to get saved and stay saved. In other cases, it can mean seeking to merge worldly wisdom with the wisdom of God. It can be a distortion and an overemphasis on something like a doctrine or, in this case, the gift of tongues. Flesh describes our unredeemed humanness. When a person is saved, the Holy Spirit takes residence in a body that has the propensity to sin. And this is going to dog us until we receive our new bodies. I think it was Billy Graham who said, we'll never be sinless this side of heaven, but we should sin less as we grow in the Lord. But we're still going to sin because we're in our unredeemed bodies. In a minute, in verses 5 and 6, we're going to see some of the ways we can yield to the flesh rather than to the spirit. Two ways of living will be on display. First, we've been aware, uh, made aware rather, that we can have not love and not even realize it. Instead of benefiting others, we risk injuring them spiritually and sometimes even physically and so it is gracious of god to reveal this to us no believer wants to lack love or to injure others so let's get into these remaining verses verses 4 through 13 how that if you have love you encourage other members of jesus body i'm not sure why but as a kid i played mystery date a few times it's marketed to girls ages 6 through 14. I don't think I had gender confusion, more like I wanted to know what to wear on a bowling date. Anybody play mystery date? You ladies, you guys, oh, thank you, David. In all, there were five possible dates. <clears throat> Four were desirable, and then there was the dud, referred to as the bum from mystery date. At the end, you'd open a plastic door to reveal your date. These next few verses feature the desirable and the undesirable believer. You don't want to be the dud, the bum from Calvary Chapel, when God opens a door for ministry. I admit I have a really hard time as a teacher in this chapter, mostly because commentary cannot improve it. Instead, it threatens to dismantle it. It's a little like dissecting a rose. It ruins its beauty, and you can't really put it back together the way it was. And so verses 4 through 7, for sure, we're not going to talk uh, too much about in, in the way of commentary, just stuff around them. So let's read it, stuff we've read before and seen probably every day on our wall on a plaque or something like that. Verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, we easily recognize each of these responses when we are the recipient. You've been treated kindly in your life. You've been treated rudely in your life. Do or do not do unto others accordingly. And so we don't need a, a long list of definitions. You, you, these are straightforward, simple. You know what the, uh, the author is saying. What I do want to talk about is this. We are not talking about self-improvement. It isn't a matter of trying to be kind or trying to be less rude. Anyone can try to improve. You don't need to be a believer to try to improve. Remember when every day you heard the expression, pay it forward? It encouraged the beneficiary of a good deed repaying the kindness to others instead of the original benefactor. Nothing wrong with that, I suppose, but it's a program designed to help people be kind. You have a person to encourage you and then empower you to be kind. We don't need a program. Uh, somebody doesn't have to do a kind thing for you for you to say, oh, gee, I should do something kind too. 
uh, you should be kind all the time because it's characteristic of the spirit who lives within you. If you're a believer, you can be kind and not be rude right now by yielding to the spirit. You can respond or not respond accordingly. I don't always believe that's true, or at least I don't always focus on that, and that's the problem, my problem. Perhaps the most popular devotional ever written, My Utmost for His Highest, Oswald Chambers writes this, The first thing I must be willing to admit when I begin to examine what controls and dominates me is that I am the one responsible for having yielded myself to whatever it may be. If I am a slave to myself, I am to blame because I yielded to myself. Likewise, if I obey God, I do so because I yielded myself to him. Another commentator put it this way, we must stay yielded to the spirit. We must say yes to the spirit when he prompts us to take certain action or say a certain word. We must give mental assent to the spirit's direction. And then we must actually obey his prompting and follow through by doing or saying what he has called us to do or say. Now, none of this is meant as a rebuke. Far from it. It's meant to set us free from re-enslavement by the flesh in order to manifest the Holy Spirit and thereby genuinely benefit others. When we looked at the gifts listed in chapter 12, we said the best way to understand them was to see them in the life of Jesus or in the lives of his disciples. That works just as well for the traits of agape in these verses. Jesus was always long-suffering and kind. He never envied or paraded himself or was puffed up or behaved rudely or sought his own or was provoked or thought evil or rejoiced in iniquity. Of course, you say, because he was God. Well, he was fully God and fully man. While on earth, in his incarnation, he set aside the prerogatives of deity to live a spirit-filled man. He didn't quit being God. He was always and will always be the God-man. But he, for lack of a better word, he didn't use his God powers. He yielded himself to the Spirit as an example to us of what that looked like. He once said, and these are all quotes from the Gospel of John, I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak those things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do the things that please him. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. He said, for I did not speak on my own initiative, but the father himself who sent me has given me commandment what to say and what to speak. And so we derive from that that everything that Jesus did and said was exactly what his father wanted him to do and say, led by the Holy Spirit. It is our example, we have that same Holy Spirit. Jesus was God-man, but he set aside the God part to live as a man. We're man, and the commonality is that we're both filled with the Spirit. And so we are able to emulate Jesus and follow his example. Verse eight, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. And whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Paul is here addressing the overemphasis the Corinthian Christians had on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They should rather emphasize love because love is permanent. It will carry over into eternity, whereas the gifts are temporary. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. There is almost no argument anymore among serious scholars about what Paul meant when he said, when that which is perfect has come. He was talking about eternity. The perfect, it wasn't the Bible when it was compiled. It wasn't Jesus, even though he is and was perfect. The perfect is eternity. And so Paul is saying that the gifts we exercise now, all of them will not be exercised in eternity because we will be in a perfect state. Uh, and one thing that will carry over, of course, is love. You won't need the gift of prophecy because the Lord will be speaking to you directly. There will be no unknown languages that need interpreting. The word of knowledge by which the Lord supernaturally reveals to you something you could not have known will vanish away because you'll know everything you need to know. By now you understand that we discuss the gifts of the Holy Spirit listed in the New Testament, all of them, in the present tense. They continued beyond the book of Acts they continue right up to today. Why do some Bible teachers say that several of them have ceased? Well, one popular reason they give that at first sounds credible 
is that they say the verb will cease is not in the passive, but in the middle voice. And it could be translated, tongues will stop by themselves. David Guzik writes, their analysis sounds scholarly, but it's disregarded by virtually all Greek scholars. Even if this translation is correct, there's nothing to suggest when tongues will cease. This passage doesn't tell us tongues will stop by themselves, and it tells us that tongues will cease only when that which is perfect has come. So that's a great example of people saying, hey, in the Greek language, it says that tongues will stop. Uh, and then they speculate that it, they stopped. With, then they have a bunch of other logical arguments about what happened in the book of Acts and such, and, and they try and say biblically that these gifts, mostly tongues, prophecy, some of the supernatural gifts, are not for today. Uh, you're probably aware of these arguments. There is actually no biblical reason to argue that any of the gifts have ceased. There, there's not a passage. The closest thing to being a passage of scripture is this passage, and it clearly, absolutely does not teach that. Everything else is an argument uh, from silence or a personal opinion. I think the real reason many believers argue against the continuation of certain gifts, let's say tongues, is this. Most of the believers who manifest these gifts do so just as the believers in Corinth did. They do it out of order and in error about their proper use. They rarely are open to biblical correction. And so if you went into the church at Corinth, you're a visitor, let's say. Uh, let's say you're a Christian, uh, but it's worse if you're not a Christian. You hear about this meeting in Corinth of the church, the believers, and you want to attend. And so you walk in, and you're a few minutes late uh, because you're more of a Calvary Chapel kind of a person uh, than a Baptist. But anyway, and I couldn't resist. Anyway, uh, so you come in a little late, and you hear something that sounds kind of weird. Uh, it, it sounds like clanging cymbals on a sounding brass, and you go in, and all of the people are standing or sitting or falling down, and they're all speaking in tongues all at the same time. Uh, or maybe some are prophesying and, and they're being loud and boisterous and, you know, that kind of a thing. Later on, Paul's going to say, when that happens, the non-believer in your presence is going to think that you're crazy and they're going to leave. Uh, and so, yet today you can go into any number of Pentecostal or charismatic churches where this happens all the time, where this is the normal service or uh, it, it's disrupted by people speaking in tongues and prophesying and all manner of crazy, wild exuberance. Uh, and when you try to read 1 Corinthians to them, they just reject it uh, and they try and twist the words. These are, especially when we get to chapter 14, the words are so easy, they're so obvious, there's nothing dark or mysterious. But so if you're a person that, that maybe doesn't, you know, doesn't, kind of live in that kind of world where you want to be all exuberant all the time and, and talking loud and all that, and you go to church and you think, hey, this can't be Christianity. And, and in a sense, it, it, they're Christians, but this isn't what God intended. And you start to look for reasons why the gift ceased, because it's easier to say there is no gift of tongues anymore than it is to say you need to start exercising this correctly. Do it the right way. Uh, and, and so... Uh, you know, I contend that, that uh, the real reason, since there really, there really isn't any biblical reason, it's a personal reason, and that's because uh, believers still abuse these gifts. Uh, and that's why this epistle, this epistle is so modern. It talks about everything that's going on in our society and a lot about what's going on in churches today. Uh, and this is certainly a, a flow that you'll get in many churches. Are these people Christian? Sure. I mean, nobody's saying anything about their, their salvation. Uh, and maybe if they were taught through the Bible, they'd at least have to wrestle with texts like this and figure out what they think that Paul had in mind. Uh, but anyway, that, that's the real reason uh, that people want to say, hey, some of these gifts are gone uh, because they see so many people abuse them. And not just speaking in tongues. I, I think I've told you over the past few weeks, every once in a while, uh, somebody has a prophecy. They come out forward with a prophecy, and then that prophecy doesn't come true. Well, well, what's all that about? It wasn't a prophecy, so why do we want to listen to a person like that and, and think that they have prophetic 
application. I mean, I'm open to the gift of prophecy, but it, it better come true. If, if it's a predictive prophecy, we can't just be throwing prophecies around. Uh, you know, that's how we hurt people. So I'm, I have the gift of prophecy, and I'm going to drop a mountain on you. I'm going to give you a personal prophecy that's not really true. By the way, these personal, if anybody ever comes to you and says, I have a personal prophecy for you, run. Doesn't matter who they are, just get out of there and ho hold your ears and scream because it's always something terrible. God showed me that you deserve to be burning in an oil pit, but there's still time to repent. Uh, thank you for that information. I appreciate it. It's terrible. Someday I'm going to do a sermon on just the personal prophecies that I've received over my career in ministry. They're pretty sweet. Anyway. Back into our text, two illustrations help you to get a grasp of the change from earth to eternity. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Paul compared our change from earth to eternity to the change from childhood to adulthood. I don't think, however, he was describing a gradual change as we grow. The way he worded this sounds more immediate. Paul was perhaps thinking of his bar mitzvah. One moment Paul was a boy, the next he was considered a man. Was he a man? No, but you, you, you get that idea. You know, that, oh, you're no longer a child, you're, uh, you're all grown up now. It's going to be a spiritual bar mitzvah in a sense when we go to be with the Lord, whether through death and resurrection or the rapture, we will immediately be matured. Then the gifts, as precious and important as they are on earth, will be left behind. They will cease. Verse 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. The mirrors in those days were made of beaten and polished bronze. No matter how well crafted a polished bronze mirror might be, it was pretty crude in giving a proper representation. That's how we see currently spiritual things, only partially. We have everything we need for life and godliness in God's word, but it is still not the same as being present with Jesus. In heaven, we will see him face to face, and we will know him perfectly, even as he knows us perfectly today. Then verse 13, <clears throat> now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. In eternity, faith will become sight when we see Jesus. Our blessed hope is the coming of the Lord, thus hope is only necessary for our time on earth. Love does not have the same temporary quality. It will go on for eternity as the very atmosphere of heaven. The Holy Spirit produces this love. Since he indwells us, these characteristics are not only possible, they are normal. Love is normal Christian behavior. In the movie, pay it forward. The lead line was, when somebody does you a good deed, don't pay it back, pay it forward. It spawned a pay it forward foundation, a pay it forward novel, and a pay it forward day. April 30th. None of that was specifically Christian, although there are tons of sermons that capitalized on it. It's a good example of what we always tend to do, make our walk with Jesus a self-improvement program. If you were to review the most popular Christian books over the last 10 or 20 years, they are really self-improvement programs masquerading as something spiritual. I don't want to mention anyone in particular because people have gone through them, people swear by them, but I just want you to hear me and check this out for yourself. They are self-improvement programs. They are things that you do on your own in order to improve your spiritual life, whether it's a number of days or a certain diet or a certain prayer or promises or whatever it is, you do it. You can't improve your flesh, not ever. It isn't a matter of my trying harder, but of believing I can yield to the indwelling Holy Spirit. I don't have to wait a period of time to be kind. I don't have to have a certain prayer to be kind or make certain promises to be kind. I can actually be kind right now if I want to. And that's where we lose it. We, 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 we only hear the part where it says, well, we're always going to fail. And then we have a tendency to want to do, fix things ourselves, and we forget that, well, wait a minute, I don't have to do this. I'm going to. I'm going to fail because I'm in this unredeemed body, but I don't have to. And I don't have to wait 10 days or 30 days or 40 days or a year. I don't have to graduate from this program 
in order to be kind right now or long suffering or any of the things I read about. I said we're going to fail all the time on account of the flesh and our two mortal enemies, Satan and the world system he oversees as its ruler. Those are powerful forces to drag us down. But listen, the answer is never a program. It's to listen and obey. You, as I said earlier, you don't need any program because you have the person. Another story. In the mood for a story? Sure you are. I'll make it fun. Uh, my golf career lasted about two years. I was in sales and uh, you were expected to go golfing with your clients, pay for their golf outings. Uh, I was the world's worst golfer. I'd like to golf better, but you know, who has time to hit a bucket of balls every week and play 18 holes? I mean, I, it's a great sport, so I'm not down on the sport. I'm just, I'm just not a golfer. But during my golf career, I met a gentleman named Pete Gallo. Uh, he was one of my clients, and this guy could golf like crazy. I mean, he was a scratch golfer, par every hole, under par, you know, just a great guy. And he decided one day he was going to teach me how to golf. And so we went out golfing, just him and I, and every hole, every stroke, he said, he, he picked the club for me, told me why he picked that club, gave me the club, and then gave me a demonstration of how I should swing that club, how hard, you know, those kinds of things. And, and this went on all day, hole after hole after hole. And uh, I still, you know, I was shanking it and hitting it into the weeds and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, every now and then he'd let me decide and it would even be worse, you know, and so I, I just, but uh, this, is, this is the moment of glory. We got to the 18th hole and, and I, he started talking, he said, I want you to do this, this and this, he picks the clubs. My first shot, good. My second shot, not so good. But my third shot was perfect. And then I parred, I parred that hole. And I'm here to tell you that it's the first and only hole I ever parred in my entire golf career. That one hold, that thank you, hold the applause. Why? Because I had someone telling me exactly what to do and how to do it. And I was able, now I still failed uh, because I was still doing it and I had, to, I had to grow in the doing of it, but it, it was someone else really guiding me and, and not, not, I can't say empowering me, but giving me the direction and the guidance I needed. And as long as I followed that, uh, I would improve and, and, and get to the point where I was, I was better than I was before. So it wasn't a self-improvement program. It was a Pete Gallo improvement program. And so, you know, buy all the books you want. It doesn't matter to me. But don't get into these programs. And the other thing, we talk about injuring other Christians. Here's what happens. I don't know what the next book will be. Maybe it's out already and I'm not aware of it. But there'll be another book suggesting another program. And people will start doing it, and then they'll burden you to do it. You need to be doing this, because all Christians need to be doing this program all at once at the same time. That's always been true. And then you start to feel bad that you're not doing it. And instead of benefiting you, uh, you feel bad. And when you tell them, oh, what's this supposed to do for you? Uh, it's supposed to help me to pray. Why don't you just pray? How about that? You've got the Holy Spirit on board, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I need this. No, you don't. You really don't. You just need the Bible and encouragement by other Christians because you have a person that cancels out all the programs. Mm -hmm.